Good morning, everybody. Bruce Crompton here of Combat Dealers and Amazing War Stories. Now, fortunately, I've been invited down again to the world famous Tank Fest at Bovington Tank Museum. And I'm here today to follow up on something that I did a couple of years ago. Now, they very kindly asked me if I would do my top five tanks. Now, the reverse of this is they've asked me to do my top bottom worst tanks. So, I'm very excited to be here and I'm gonna have a wonderful couple of days, but this is my introduction to you and my worst bottom five tanks. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. The Jag Tiger. Now, this beast, and I'm gonna call it a beast because look at the size of it, was an absolute panic build. Right during the war, all the way through it, Hitler always believed bigger was better. And believe me, there was something even bigger than this. But this particular design housed a 128 millimeter gun, but it was the sheer weight of it. Now the big problem was, as the war proceeded, materials were very, very hard for the Germans to get hold of and use. Obviously the quality of a lot of the tanks started to suffer actually the manufacturing of as well. Also, the Germans never went over till right at the end of the war to some diesel variations. So they were using the same engine in this that they'd been using the Tiger, the King Tiger, and now the Jag Tiger. Unfortunately, it wasn't man enough for it. They just opened it up, put the same engine in. Now the sheer weight of this really was a problem. Again, with something like this, the maintenance on it is just incredible. The suspension, again, there were problems with it. The engine and the gearbox were really problematic. Now on the good side of it, you know, with a 128 millimeter gun, it really was an accurate thing, but it had to be in a static position. Now in a static position, it became a target and they didn't produce that many of them because it, I mean, I've, I can't say a lot more, as much as I love it, it was a pink elephant. Along with the Dora gun, this was probably the two biggest mistakes they made while producing tanks during the Second World War. Produced in 1944, right the way through to 45, but hardly very many were built. And this is one only of a couple of examples left in the world. So it does rate in my top bottom five tanks. As beautiful as it is, and I'd love to have it, it would be a nightmare. Imagine traveling on the road with this, what it would do to the road. It's the maintenance behind these things. Also inside, I just will mention, this prob the problem with it was the loader. You had to load the shell and the cartridge separately. So it took time. There's a lot of room in there, but it's just the sheer weight was too heavy for the mechanics, the gearbox and the engine. So unfortunately, this goes in me bottom five tanks. Hi, right, I'm on number four. Now, unfortunately, I'm a very patriotic person, but this thing, the tortoise, was an absolute monstrosity. Now, with all the items that I've picked, all the top bottom five tanks, a lot revolve around panic, okay? This thing was designed specifically because they were worried about getting into Germany, major fortifications, and coming up with the heaviest of German tanks. So it was a stopgap. The design was flawed from the start. It was basically too big, too heavy. Transporting it on roads was an absolute nightmare. For the crew inside, that was even more terrible. To load the gun, which was a 3.7 inch anti-aircraft gun, which they converted to, a, to put on this tank, they changed inside, so you had to put the shell, then the cartridge in afterwards. And it was a logistical nightmare. 
just to move this thing. I mean, look at the size of it. And as much as I'm really patriotic and I love it, you know, this is the type of thing I'd like to have in my man cave. As a weapon during the Second World War, it was absolutely useless. Now, the two prototypes weren't finished till 1947. And then one was tested in 1948. And everybody knew then that it was complete overkill. It wasn't fast enough to keep up with the faster tanks. Yes, the gun and how it'd been positioned with, instead of the ball turret, it'd been put on a sort of gimbal but it could have taken out most of the Russian tanks that we might have come up against post-war, post-1945, which was a very dodgy time. But unfortunately, this beast, as impressive as it looks, really, really didn't come up to the mark. And that's why, for me, this is in my bottom five worst tanks ever designed. Now we get to number three. Now, unfortunately, another British design. But what you've got to do with this tank, which is TOG 2, is draw your mind back to the tanks of the First World War, because the concept of this tank evolved from things like Little Willie and the tanks that we successfully used during the First World War. Unfortunately, conditions for tanks change very, very rapidly. Now, if you look at this and imagine the turret being taken off, you've got what is a First World War tank. And it was hurriedly designed as well. There were some very good attributes to this. Revolutionary, it had two electric motors which drove the gears both sides. There was no gearbox in it, so it had a lot of potentially really revolutionary items in it. But look at the size of it. Imagine the maintenance on something like this in the field when you broke down, you threw a track. Inside, it's like a land ship, a battleship on tracks. This even dwarfs the big German tanks, the King Tigers, the Jad Tigers. But it's just its size and the complexity of it made it completely obsolete when it was very, eventually finished in 1941. Again, it never saw service because the idea of the design of this tank goes right the way back to the First World War. Now, obviously, I'm very proud of the fact that we say tank, the design, how we started the design with tanks and how we overcame the problems. But in between the war years, we had a lot of catching up to do. The Germans had taken a lot of the best of what they'd seen in the First World War and made lighter, faster tanks. We, on the other hand, seemed to think that bigger was better. And unfortunately, as beautiful as this is, it's an absolute monster. I can't imagine what it would have been like trying to use this in the field. As I say, imagine the sort of backup facilities you've got to have. Each tank will break down at some point, be it on its way to a battle, be it during the battle, but imagine trying to work on this thing out in the countryside, in the mud, in the rain or whatever. Again, had some very good features and for me, the main thing was that they were using diesel when they designed this. You know, something that the Germans didn't pick up to right at the end of the war, the Russians were using it. But again, it's just the sheer size and weight of this thing. Imagine trying to get this to the front and actually use it. Now, unfortunately, they made TOG 1 and TOG 2. This is TOG 2, it was actually finished in 1941, but by then, everybody realized that this thing was just too big and a bit of a monstrosity. Again, I'd love to have it in my garden, but it's in the best place here, which is Bovington Tank Museum. Number two, the lovely, but for me, not particularly worthy of a lot of people's awards of how good it was, is the Crusader Three. Now, this particular tank, the design, and how it was built, it was specifically built for working in open planes. And when it was first designed and tested on Salisbury Plain, it was wonderful. But it was first deployed really in the war, in the war situation in the desert. Now, it's a beautiful tank, it really is. The lines and the advantage of this tank was it was very, very fast. But because of the conditions that it was operating in, 
it had huge mechanical problems. More of these things broke down on their way to the front line during the battle, and they were constantly in need of maintenance. And for the crews in the baking heat of the North African deserts, that can't have been very pleasant. Obviously, comfort wasn't something that the designers thought about. Now, this particular model has got the six pounder gun on, most had the two pounder gun on. And again, the designs, and it, it looks like a little racing car, but as they got further into North Africa and got into Tunisia, it just couldn't handle the terrain. It was built for more open plane warfare, okay to a certain extent, it was okay in the desert, except for the mechanical problems, obviously the dust and the conditions they were coming into, but once it got into more unstable ground, it had to be replaced. And come the time they got into Tunisia, it was very quickly replaced. As I say, beautiful looking tank. I really admire the lines on it. For me, it's like a little sport car, but unfortunately, it is in my bottom five. And for the people that don't and disagree with me, I'm sorry, but I've got to pick one that I think there were problems with. And this one in particular is something I believe was not really built for the conditions it found itself fighting in. Now my number one bottom worst tank for me, and people will probably disagree with me, is the M3 Grab. Why? A number of reasons. Again, panic. This particular design was rushed into production to get something with a 75 millimeter gun into the battle arena. But look at the size of the thing. It had a crew of six. This gun could only traverse so many degrees. It had a piddly 70, 37 mil gun on the top and it was just a monster. Now it was used for some time in the North African campaign, but basically the Shermans then arrived with the 75 millimeter gun with the turret on top. So this became obsolete. They did ship a lot and a lot were used in Burma, but the basic problem with this, in an open battlefield, look at the size of it. It's a moving target. A crew of six inside. You know, you can imagine what it was like in there. It was also a riveted tank. Now riveted tanks have a real condition that if they're hit, they tend to buckle far more than welded ones and they cause all kinds of interior problems. So this particular tank has got numerous things that I don't like. The fact for me, the most important thing is it stands out. I mean, just look at that. I wouldn't want to be in that. If you're in the desert and you've got a German pounds of four pounds of three coming to water, or even in Tunisia, you are a sitting target in this. You can't move the guns, as I said. The 75 millimeter gun was actually a very good gun and it could take out the opposing German tanks, but it was the sheer size of this thing. And again, this was a panic bill. They wanted to get something with a large gun into the battlefield arena until the arrival of the Sherman with the 75 mil turret made a huge difference. So I'm sorry for everybody that disagrees with me, but for me, this is my bottom number one worst tank. But thanks for watching anyway. And I would appreciate any comments. No foul language though, thanks. Well then, ladies and gentlemen, I really hope you've enjoyed my version of the worst five tanks. But everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But if you like it, please subscribe to YouTube, the Tank Museum, and follow us on Patreon. Because as you can see from this wonderful event we've got at Tankfest, you're missing out if you don't get on board and follow what these people are doing down here. It's preserving history. But whether you agree my bottom five or not, is open to interpretation. But I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot.